Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our 56th session of the Med AI Group Exchange. This week, we have Paul Liang from Carnegie Mellon University here with us to speak about his research on multimodal representation learning. Paul is a PhD student in machine learning at CMU, advised by Louis Philip Morency and Rasnan Salakustinov. His research lies in the foundations of multimodal machine learning with applications in socially intelligent AI, understanding human and machine intelligence, natural language processing, healthcare, and education. His research is generously supported by a Facebook PhD fellowship, as well as a Center for Machine Learning and Health fellowship. He has been recognized by awards at the New Eve's 2019 workshop on federated learning, as well as ICML 2017. Thank you, Paul, for joining us today. Before we start, could you tell us how you want to take questions? Um, questions at the end will be preferred. Okay, sounds good. So let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. Without further ado, let me hand it over to Paul. Awesome. Thank you so much, C, for the introduction. So this, in this talk, I'm going to be talking about uh, multimodal representation learning. In the first part, I'm going to give more of a tutorial, the introductions of this topic, which is super applicable to healthcare data. And a lot of this tutorial is based on this recent tutorial I've been giving at uh, conferences like CVPR and NACL. In the second half, I'm going to talk about some recent directions that I've been working with towards in uh, multimodal representation learning. So in recent years, we've seen amazing advances in digital intelligence, AI that can understand digital content on the internet, such as images, videos, audios, and so on. We've seen amazing advances in physical intelligence, AI that can understand physical objects in the world and navigate in the world, and also social intelligence, humans, uh, AI that can better understand humans and in the end towards better interaction with humans. So perhaps some of the key drivers for these types of AI is that of multimodal AI. Understanding digital intelligence requires AI to understand written language, images, audios, and graphs, such as social networks. Understanding physical intelligence requires AI to understand videos, physical lidars, and other physiological sensors. And understanding social intelligence requires AI to understand human speech, human faces, human language, and other human sensors. So obviously there's a lot of interest in multimodal AI, but let's go down to the basics. First of all, what is a modality? You know, many things in perceive of modalities, but to give a more formal definition, a modality refers to a way in which something is expressed in the world or perceived in the world. And typically when we look at these modalities, they come from some form of sensor. We have real world data expressed in some form of modality, and they're recorded through these sensors into digital representations that we can then use in computational methods. And then you can start looking at raw modalities, which are those closest to your sensor, to abstract modalities, which are those very far away from your sensor through more pre-processing. Raw modalities can be raw speech signals that we obtain from human conversations, raw images, raw videos, and raw sensors directly uh, obtained. We can slowly start to extract, for example, language from these speech signals, or we can start detecting objects from these images. So that gets more abstract. And finally, we can even go to abstract representations, for example, sentiment from language or object categories from detected objects. So you have a whole spectrum of raw to abstract modalities, which are very commonly studied in computer science. So multimodal, uh, therefore, a dictionary definition is problems involving multiple modalities. But from a more research-oriented definition, I like to think of multimodal as a science of two things, heterogeneous and interconnected data. Heterogeneous because necessarily the different modalities that we see in the world are very different from each other. They show different qualities. But at the same time, these modalities are not independent. They're connected with each other, which requires us to process them jointly for many problems. So firstly, heterogeneity. The fact that information present in these different modalities will often show different qualities, different structures, and different representations. And again, when you're thinking of these new modalities, you encounter these, for example, healthcare problems, we always want to look at it at a spectrum from homogeneous modalities with more similar qualities, all the way towards heterogeneous modalities with very diverse qualities. Homogeneous modalities can be things like images from two cameras, where you're still mostly taking images of the same object, object just from different views, right? And with different differences in your cameras. You can look at text from two different languages. Uh, they can be very similar if the languages are from the same language family. They can be more different if languages are from different language families with different vocabularies. You can look at language and vision, right? Language and vision, they still refer typically to the same underlying concepts, 
but they are expressed very differently. One in a form of a sequence of words, the other in a spatial orientation of objects. And you can go even more heterogeneous, right? Healthcare modalities, other modalities that don't even refer to perhaps the same underlying concept. And as a side note, the abstract modalities that we've been looking at, ones that are encoded subsequently through neural network representations, they have more opportunity to be homogenous, right? They can start representing similar semantic meaning and become more homogenous, whereas raw modalities at the raw level tend to be more different from each other. So the first key, key takeaway from the talk is that when you encounter new modalities, for example, in these healthcare problems or other problems you may encounter, the first thing you want to reason about is the different dimensions of heterogeneity present across your modalities. I'm going to use a running example here. You have an image, and you also have a language description, a teacup on the right of a laptop in a clean room. The first key dimension of heterogeneity is the underlying distribution of these modalities. Can you take your modalities, which are often at a high dimensional level, break them down into individual elements, and start looking at how these individual elements are represented? In images, we have perhaps object categories. You no, know, an image, uh, a, a cropped object region of your laptop, a cropped object region of your, of your teacup, and your sofa, and so on. And in language, after you remove your stop words, you might have a key uh, bag of words, right? Uh, the important words that you see in language. So that's distribution. Another key difference that people typically tend to model is that of granularity. The fact that different modalities exhibit different sampling rates and different frequencies. For example, you see a certain number of objects per image. You might see a certain number of words per minute when you start recording words. And again, when you go to high dimensional, high frequency sensors, you have really difficult uh, high frequencies and high sampling rates that you have to model. A third dimension is that of information. Given the individual elements, given the granularity at which these elements are sampled, now you have these entire modalities and you can start looking at the information contained within these entire modalities. So you can look at entropy, right? How much information is contained in one modality and how that influences your prediction and how much information is contained within the other modality and how that influences your prediction. Structure how modalities are oriented. Uh, in images, you have a spatial structure related across your modalities. And in language, you have this underlying grammatical structure based on syntax trees, which is hierarchical in nature. So this study of structure also informs of what are the best unimodal encoders to represent our data. Is it an encoder that represents spatial structure, the convolutional neural networks for images? Or is it an encoder that perhaps more respects the latent grammatical structure in, uh, in sentences, like tree LSTMs or transformers? Noise, the fact that different modalities also tend to exhibit very different types of noise. Like in images, you have camera blurs, and you have very specific models that are meant to deal with these camera blurs. In language, especially if the text is typed from a laptop, you have these natural uh, misspellings based on how close the letters are on a keyboard. And again, as you look at other modalities, what are the specific types of noise encountered in these modalities, and what is the best way to tackle them? And finally, relevance. The fact that different modalities can allow us to infer different parts of the world. Right? For example, in this image, you can think that it's a recreational room, it's a living room, and the person is likely right-handed. And from the text, you might think it's a workspace or a study room. So that's relevance. So again, the first key takeaway, when you start looking at new modalities, especially in other research areas, what are the key dimensions of heterogeneity that is going to influence how you subsequently model these modalities? The second takeaway, the fact that despite modalities being heterogeneous, they are typically interconnected. The fact that modalities are often related and share some complementary information that enables them to interact. We're gonna look at these interconnections from two dimensions. The first one, connections. Just the fact that modalities are often related and share some common information. We're also gonna look at cross-modal interactions. The fact that these modality elements typically interact to form new information useful for inference. So what are some examples of connections? At the most basic level, again, from this image and text running example, you have the fact that certain references and objects visually refer to some words in the sentence, right? Teacup, laptop. These can be seen from a statistical perspective as being associated, the fact that they co-occur or correlate together. And if you have some underlying knowledge about the problem, you know that they are semantically corresponding to each other, right? The fact that one is a reference to the other because they share the same underlying concept of a laptop or a teacup. You can then go deeper. You can look at this teacup and infer that it looks clean, right? That's a reference between the clean teacup in the image and the reference to clean in the, in the sentence. You can look at the sofa in the image and infer that this is a room indoors. 
So again, these are not simple associations, but the fact that one depends on the other. Using one modality, you can infer information in the other modality. And more generally, these dependencies can be seen through the lens of causal dependencies, the fact that one modality causes the other, or there's some underlying causal relationship, or temporal dependencies, the fact that one modality perhaps occurs after the other. From a semantic perspective, these generalize correspondences to relationships, the fact that they are related using some underlying attribute, for example, function. So those are connections. A second key term is that of interactions. Once you start using these modalities to infer a particular response for a particular task, you typically see interactions between these and that new modalities to get new information. So what's an example of that? Again, using these two examples, what if I ask the question, is this indoors? Right, from the image, you see a sofa, you see a laptop, you see a teacup, you probably say, yes, it's indoors. You look at the text, you probably also say, yes, it's also indoors. So here's an example of a redundant interaction, the fact that both modalities give rise to the same inferences. But this doesn't mean both modalities are not useful. If you have both, you can then enhance your response. You know that you're more confident in predicting that same response. So you're more likely to say yes with higher confidence that it's indoors if you have both modalities. If I ask another question, is this a living room? If you have the image, you might say yes. You, have, you see a sofa, you see that it's pretty recreational. It's probably in a living room. If you see the language, you're more likely to say no. It's probably a study room because you see laptops. This is an example of a non-redundant interaction. The fact that both modalities give you different inferences on the task. And in this case, when we have both modalities, the ideal case is that we want these interactions to dominate. We want one of the answers to dominate over the other, specifically the answer that yes, this should be a living room and therefore ignoring the language modalities prediction. And you can see that these can start slowly getting very, very complex, the interactions that you want to discover. If I ask you, should I work here? If I'm looking for a place to work, should I work here? If I look at the image, I might say, yes, maybe. It looks very comfortable. It's a very comfortable sofa, but the table's a bit too small. If I look at the language, I might say, maybe too. It's clean and there's tea. Maybe I should work here. And again, you have very non-redundant information. Both modalities give you very different information. And together, we have both modalities, more likely new information emerges. Your final answer to whether I should work here is going to be based on a very nonlinear combination of these two modalities inferences. And it's also going to depend from person to person. So you can slowly start seeing the very nonlinear cases of interactions that might emerge when you have two different modalities. So all of these terms, uh, redundancy, non-redundancy, are actually borrowed from this early paper back in 1999, way before people started working on multimodal from a machine learning perspective. And this paper studied these cross-modal interactions from a behavioral science view. You have these animals who want to use multimodal behaviors to communicate with each other, like sounds, actions, gestures, smell, and so on. And again, you have these redundant behaviors, which can be equivalent or enhancing each other. And you also have these non-redundant interactions where different modalities give you different inferences. And you have all these other possibilities of new information resulting when you have both modalities, either independent interactions, dominating interactions, one modality modulating the other, or the emergence of new information. Again, these are all possible cases of multimodal interactions that you might encounter in your data sets. So it's always useful to perhaps run through some of these thought experiments when you have new data sets and try to reason about what are the new interactions that might be there and how can we best capture them. And in fact, we just touched upon the first dimension of these interactions based on the response, right? Looking at how different modalities give rise to different responses. There's also several other dimensions, which um, we can, you can look at these papers for previous work. One is that of inputs, the number of inputs involved in these interactions, whether it's a bimodal interaction involving two modalities, trimodal involving three modalities, or high modal involving more and more modalities. And the more modalities that are involved in these interactions, the more computational issues that might arise. The underlying mechanics, how can you actually model these interactions? Is it an additive interaction? Is it based on multiplicative interactions like tensors? Or do you have to use more domain knowledge to give causal or logical interactions between your modalities? And finally, as we've seen, it depends a lot on your task, on your context, right? Different inference tasks are going to infer, are, are going to bring out different interactions across your modalities. So that's the first and second main key takeaways, the fact that multimodal data Multimodal machine learning is a science of heterogeneous and interconnected data. 
the fact that data is very different and what are the best ways to model these differences in data, and also the fact that your data is similar, that they're related and share certain common qualities, and how can we discover these common qualities. So in the next part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about some of the core challenges we've distilled in recent multimodal machine learning research. It's based partially on a 2016 survey uh, from my advisor and the group, along with several courses we've been teaching at CMU. And we also have this updated new survey paper that we're releasing on archive in a couple of weeks, really looking at these new six challenges in multimodal machine learning and the key recent directions from our group and also from the broader research community. We're also teaching this new course at CMU. So if you're really interested in this field, you can follow the course. I'm going to post lecture videos every week for more details. But essentially, we've looked at multimodal, the science of heterogeneous interconnected data. So what is multimodal machine learning then? Multimodal machine learning then aims to model these two key properties, the fact that data is different and the fact that they're related. So typically, we take in all these modalities, we train some model um, using ways like supervised, unsupervised learning to learn some representation that's useful for some task. It can be um, just representation learning, or you can learn it directly for a task. But we're not going to look at multimodal ML based on these different learning paradigms. That is the point of just conventional machine learning. We want to ask the question, what are the core multimodal challenges that we have not been studied so much in conventional machine learning? And in the survey paper that we're coming up releasing really soon, we're going to look at we've distilled six core challenges in the multimodal machine learning research field. The first big one is representation. How can I learn representations that reflect the interactions between elements across different modalities? So if I look at modalities like this, each modality is gonna consist of elements, for example, sentences of words, image regions of objects. I'm just gonna look at one pair of elements. And how can I take these local elements, one from each modality, and learn a representation from them? And there's three big areas of sub-challenges. One is that of fusion, taking both elements and learning one representation from both of them. This is really useful if you want to combine information for a prediction task. We also have coordination. We are taking elements, learning separate representations, but coordinating them using some function. This is useful if you want to do things like retrieval. You want to go from one modality to the other modality based on a similarity function. And this can also be useful for prediction in the presence of missing modalities. If you're keeping two separate representations, one for each modality, even as one is missing, you can still use the other representation for prediction. Recent directions have also looked at fission. Right? If I take two local elements, can I then learn more representations than what I actually started off with? This is useful because the shared representation in the middle captures common information, and the other representations can capture modality-specific information, the uniqueness of each modality. And that can be useful in certain tasks as well. Given local representation, the next challenge we're going to look at is alignment. Can I discover the connections across multiple elements across your modalities? So now we look at all these elements, and the first challenge is just learning the connections. Which elements in one modality are connected to which others in other modalities? This can also be seen as explicit alignment or grounding. So one common task here is having images and asking a specific query, right? You know, what color is the man, what color is the shirt that the man is wearing? So that requires you to directly connect the references shirt to the image of the shirt. Contextualized representations don't just look at the alignment, but rather use the alignment connections implicitly to learn better representations. But eventually, you still want to learn a representation for some task. So contextualized representations are perhaps best exemplified by transformers. The fact that you have multiple elements across different modalities, how can you contextualize them to discover the implicit connections? But the goal is to eventually learn better representations after your transformer layers. And finally, pictorially, we've seen all these modalities that are perfectly segmented into discrete elements. But in real world, we usually see time series data. We see high dimensional continuous data, where it's not clear where you should segment these modality boundaries. And how can you convert these continuous elements into discrete formats? So segmentation studies the granularity and the discretization of these individual modality elements. So given local representations learned between individual elements, also given alignment between multiple elements, the third challenge involves reasoning. How can we combine the private knowledge that we've obtained, usually through multiple inferential steps, to, to um, solve our task? So typically, you can do this through multiple layers of neural networks, which is great, but we don't really know what's going on. So a lot of work in reasoning involves explicitly modeling the reasoning structure. 
you have two elements, can you learn some intermediate representation? How can I transform this intermediate representation to the next? And how can I do so repeatedly until I have enough information for the task? If you want to be interpretable, some of these intermediate representations aren't just based on neural networks, but can be based on something that is more understandable, like attention maps. These attention maps can also become further discretized, like words or hard attention, which are the best case, right? You can understand exactly what each layer of the model is doing as you do this multi-step inference towards your prediction. But typically, if you want to use attention maps or you want to use words as an intermediate medium, you must have some external knowledge about the problem. If you have no knowledge, you're probably stuck using black box models. But if you have knowledge, you can then start using uh, methods to design the exact structure of your reasoning or the exact intermediate representations within reasoning. So the sub-challenges here involve modeling the structure. What is the exact way that you should combine information for a task? What intermediate concepts I should use? Dense representations, attention maps, or words, or something more discrete? The way that you can infer subsequent knowledge from previous ones, whether that's causal inference or logical inference, and what types of external knowledge can be best used to inform this reasoning process. Challenge four involves generation. Sometimes you care about prediction, but sometimes you also care about generating more multimodal data. For example, can I summarize high dimensional data that is multimodal in nature into lower dimensional ones? Can I translate from one modality to the other, such so as taking an image and captioning it? Or can I use latent variables to create more multimodal data that I, that I started with while still maintaining coherence across my modalities? So these are categorized based on the information content, whether you're reducing, maintaining, or expanding your information content. Challenge five is transference. Typically, all our modalities are not provided beforehand. We might have some modalities which have less data and some modalities which have more data. So in this case, how can I transfer information between my modalities? Typically to help some target modality which might be noisy or with limited resources. So some sub-challenges here involve transfer learning using high resource modalities to first train a model that you can then transfer the low resource ones. Co-learning, where you're using external modalities for help, either at the input level or at the output level. And model induction, so keeping two models separate but sharing information between them. So model induction is perhaps uh, best captured by the co-training algorithm. Learning two separate modalities for each, mo uh, learning two separate models for each modalities, but making sure that they agree in their predictions. And finally, the last challenge is quantification. Can I revisit all of my previous challenges through empirical and theoretical studies to again look at the two core challenges in multimodal machine learning? The fact that data is heterogeneous and how can I better look at the heterogeneity in data sets and black box models? The fact that data is interconnected and how can I discover these interactions from data or from pre-trained models? And what are the learning challenges that arise from multimodal learning? So to summarize, we've covered many multimodal challenges. Typically, you start with representation. So these are local elements. You can either fuse, coordinate, or factorize them into more representations. Alignment looks at connecting multiple elements across modalities to discover their relationships. And representation and alignment typically occur one after the other in many multimodal problems. Once you have this information, can I do reasoning in a principled approach? Can I know how to combine my information in the most interpretable and robust way in order to make a prediction. Sometimes I don't care about making a supervised prediction, but I might care about generating more modalities, you know, either from latent var variables to multimodal data, or maybe from one modality to the other. And sometimes I might also care about transfer. Can I use high resource data from one modality to help my prediction in something else? And finally, the challenge of quantification revises all of these other challenges by really looking at these models and how they work. How do they model heterogeneity in my data? And how do they model the interconnections in my data? So that was the first part of the talk. That was a mini tutorial. We're gonna put this um, survey paper up really soon. That's gonna go in depth into all of these six challenges. It's gonna cover some of the work done by myself and also done by the broader community in making advances towards each of these six directions. But again, when looking at new multimodal data sets, new multimodal problems, it typically helps to contextualize the problem into one of these core challenges and looking at what's been done and what are the new innovations within that technical challenge.
So in the second part, I'm going to focus on some of my recent work. I've uh, been looking at multimodal representation learning in particular. How can we take all these modalities and learn a representation that again tackles the two core challenges, capturing the heterogeneity between my modalities and capturing the connections between my modalities. So we're going to look at multimodal representation learning using this schematic, the fact that these representations are typically learned from models that take in modalities as input, um, learn some representation layer, and train for some prediction. And we've seen amazing advances in these models for certain modalities, such as language and learning, and for certain tasks, such as image question answering, captioning, and retrieval. But one core challenge I've been looking at is how can we get these models to generalize to this whole spectrum of other modalities that we might care about and this whole spectrum of other tasks that we might care about. So in other words, how can we construct these multimodal models and data sets that are able to be applicable across many modalities and tasks? I've done some recent work towards generalizing in the case of parallel modalities. So if your modalities are paired up, how can we transfer from one modality to the other? And also in the case of non-parallel modalities. So we have a really large number of modalities and tasks. Each of each data set only looks at a subset of them. How can we generalize in these non-parallel scenarios? The other big direction I've been looking at is quantification. We have these amazing multimodal models, but they're typically black box neural network models. Can we take these models, zoom into them, and better understand how they model heterogeneity and how do they model these interactions? How can we better understand how these models work? So before we go into these technical details on generalization and quantification, one question emerges. So how can we even create realistic benchmarks to study these questions in the first place? And for that, the first contribution I'm going to talk about is that of multi-bench. So multi-bench is, is a recent uh, real-world multimodal benchmark we've released to test generalization and quantification. So firstly, to test generalization, if you want to understand how are your models generalized across many modalities and tasks, you naturally need to have diverse modalities and tasks from different research areas in the first place. Likewise, if you want to quantify your real-world qualities of how these models work, you also need holistic evaluation criteria reflecting these real-world scenarios. And finally, to do this at scale across multiple models, you also need to have a standardized implementation drawing upon the innovations in modeling across many different research areas in multimodal machine learning. So multi-bench contributes exactly this, this machine learning pipeline that goes from diverse data sets, standardized data loading, uh, encapsulating a broad range of models and implementing them in a standardized manner, and having comprehensive evaluation metrics to ensure that these models work holistically in a wide range of scenarios. So this benchmark consists of many challenges. It has data sets for fusion, alignment, uh, translation, and co-learning. It also covers many domains from effective computing to healthcare, robotics, and finance. It also covers a broad range of more than 20 modalities. Some of the interesting data sets in this benchmark, which is of course publicly available, include that for affect recognition. Can you take in what humans say, how they say it through gestures, how they say it through their speech, and make predictions on their sentiment and emotions? It includes uh, data sets for robotics. Can we can we log data of these robotic sensors, what they're seeing through cameras, and what they're feeling through haptic sensors, and estimate how well they're, they're able to kind of um, insert this peg into a hole, this insertion task. And also in healthcare, can we look at, in this, this case, this is the public mimic data set, can we look at um, basic information about patients expressed in a form of a table modality, and also time series data of their information in the ICU, and use that to make predictions on their mortality and disease codes. We also have a wide range of standardized models, uh, models ranging from multimodal data pre-processing to various unimodal models. These are the models designed to capture heterogeneity in each modality. Um, the fusion paradigms, models to capture the interconnections between modalities, different ways of optimizing these models and different training procedures to ensure that they optimize in the best way. So even though we start with only 20 recent models from the community, uh, we implement them in a modular manner so that you can actually mix and match. You can mix and match up to 200 combinations of these models if you want to try, out, try them out. So what are some key takeaways from this benchmark? The first key takeaway is that it's usually beneficial to standardize. We've seen amazing multimodal research in many different areas, uh, but there's no one common theme, no one common standardization of the methods and the ideas across all of these areas. So over here, 
we're looking at this sarcasm detection data set, a very interesting one, one that has not been studied super in depth. And this belongs to the effective computing category. And what we can do is we can take a look at the best in-domain method proposed on that data set. That gets you about 66% performance. And you can look at the best out-domain. So taking methods proposed in other domains like robotics, language invasion, healthcare, and just directly applying it and getting it to work on this data set. And that immediately gets to 72% accuracy for about 5% boost. So simply applying methods in other areas through standardization already helps you to perform uh, to perform better on nine out of the 15 data sets. And these data sets are typically ones that, as you guessed it, are probably understudied. And for example, predicting humor, predicting uh, healthcare, um, HCI, robotics, and finance. So it's typically these you know, tasks that, that benefits from standardization uh, are the ones that you know, are relatively understudied as compared to language and vision research. But there's some negative results from this data set as well. So if you start looking at some of these models, like late fusion, you can start plotting its performance on in-domain data sets, so data sets that the model was designed for, and also out-of-domain data sets. So how will this method generalize those to other data sets outside of domain? And for multi-model transformers, for example, it performs really well on in-domain data sets, uh, specifically effective computing. Once you start applying it to other modalities, it's not easy to get them working, right? So there's still a large gap a large variance in the performance of these models as you apply them to other modalities and other research areas. Uh, this is the same version of the graph, just color-coded with this specific area. So over here, you see these transformers, they work really well for effective computing, but they struggle once you start applying them to your high-frequency robotic sensors and finance data with really high, uh, really low signal-to-noise ratios. So therefore, generalization across modalities and tasks is still very difficult. But multi-bench is a first step towards benchmarking how well models are able to generalize. So given multi-bench, I'm going to look at two recent works I've done. I'm just going to go through them really quickly. The first case is, again, generalization with parallel modalities. If you have modality pairs across your two tasks, how can we transfer information while using these pairs? So one common motivating example for this is the fact that you have a target task, such as audio classification, which doesn't have that much data. Right? It's very difficult to do classification directly by collecting uh, label data. But on the other hand, you have some source task, such as image classification, which has a lot of data. It's easy to get images, and perhaps it's easier to annotate images because it's quicker to annotate them. And the question becomes, can you make use of some paired amount of information? Right? If you don't have any pairs, it's going to be impossible to transfer information. But if you have some paired data, either in the form of strong pairs, so exact correspondences between an image and perhaps the sound that that animal makes within the image, or weak pairs, right? do we have long range videos of many animals matching many sounds, but not exact corresponding to each other? Can I make use of some of these modality pairs to help me generalize, to take information from the source and apply it to improve performance in a target. So let's actually look at a simple statistical setup um, to look at when generalization is useful. I'm going to assume that for this target modality, there's d-dimensional data in the form of vector. I'm going to look at a very simple linear model that learns a d-dimensional parameter vector uh, with some noise to try to predict my label. So the data is going to be generated this way. Your d-dimensional vectors, you're transforming them using a teacher vector plus some noise to the actual label. So you can then start to do unimodal learning by taking the paired data that you've generated synthetically, minimizing the mean squared error, which is doing maximum likelihood estimation, and seeing how well this parameter vector that you're learning, which is again d-dimensional, is going to be when you're trying to predict this task. So again, the expected unimodal error is going to take on a form like this, a standard generalization error that scales proportionally to the number of dimensions you're estimating, d, is going to be proportional to the variance in your data, so the the randomness in your data that you can't hope to model, that's sigma square. And more importantly, it's going to be inversely proportional to the number of samples that you have to estimate your parameter vector, that's nt. And this can be very difficult because, not surprisingly, if you have very few samples in your target, so nt is small, this loss is going to be very large. But a good thing is that if you do the same prediction for your source task, you just train a classifier for the source task, it's going to be better. It's going to be inversely proportional to NS, the number of samples in the source. And if you have many samples in a source, this loss is going to be very low. So how can I then use the aligned pairs to help me generalize? So we can model alignment using a full rank matrix that transforms data from one modality to the other. 
right? So this full rank matrix plus some noise. If the noise has very little variance, then you're basically getting one-to-one -one mappings between your modalities. That's strong alignment. If your noise has high variance, then you're getting instead weak alignment. The fact that perhaps a cluster of images of horses and zebras is related to a cluster of audio that horses and zebras make. So this variance allows us to control for either strong or weak alignment. And then you can start analyzing how what we can do in learning this generalization. If I try to learn this alignment by learning this alignment matrix using a maximum likelihood estimation, I'm again going to get an alignment error that's proportional to the number of parameters I have to estimate, d squared, proportional to the variance of the noise in the alignment, that's sigma squared, and inversely proportional to the number of alignment samples that I have. So again, a similar form of generalization error. And that gives us a very simple uh, equation for when we would like to generalize across your modalities. You can either do learning in a target, so just ignore whatever you have to source, just embrace the fact that you have very little data on your target. That gets you d sigma squared over nt, the number of samples you have in your target. Or you can try to use your source, but to use your source, you have to first estimate the alignment between your source and target, right? So you add up two terms, the alignment error and the source modality error. And therefore, it makes sense to do generalization if the right-hand side is less than the left-hand uh, left side. So when does that hold true? We just plot this equation on a graph where the x-axis is the number of samples and the y-axis error. You can first start by plotting just the error if you learn in your target modality. Recall that this is bad because you don't have that many samples in your target. You can then plot the error in your source modality, which is going to be better because you have more samples in your source. And more importantly, we look at the important one is this purple term, right? Adding up the source modality error with the alignment error. So in the case of strong alignment, immediately you're doing well. Immediately you can use information from the source and this total error slowly decreases as the more aligned samples you have. But it always stays below just learning in the target. So more aligned pairs help, but at most by the performance of your source task. And if you have strong alignment, it's almost always preferable to learn this alignment. But we usually care about the case of weak alignment. It's not typically the case where you can get exact pairs between your modalities. So in weak alignment, we see that if the number of aligned pairs is little, you have very high error. It's going to be very difficult to estimate this weak alignment. But the more aligned samples you have, you're going to slowly start seeing this error decrease until, again, it's better than just learning in a target. So the quality of alignment matters. But more importantly, even weak alignment can be preferable to supervised learning in a target if you have enough weakly paired data. So in practice, of course, we're not going to try to map from one modality to the other by learning this full rank matrix. We're going to do alignment instead. Um, and you can show that translating from one modality to the other is can approximately equal to aligning modalities. So taking pairs of modalities from one, predicting that they're the same, and taking one modality and a negative pair and predicting that they're different. Right? So asymptotically, both of these learning paradigms are the same. So this then gives us a formula for coordinating these representations taking modalities, encoding them to some representation space. And this encoder can be specialized to capture heterogeneity across your data. And once you have these representations, use a coordination function to ensure that they are similar. Right? So this captures the interconnections across your data. And these coordination functions can be done with cosine similarity, use kernel similarity, or you can use correlation-based similarity. So the final method looks like this. You're trying to learn a representation space, where the first modality you can classify. You can classify from a second modality as well. But more importantly, if I have paired data, either strong or weak, you bring them close together in representation space. So I have image of a horse and audio of a horse in the form of strong pairs, I bring them close together. And if I have longer videos, right, videos of many fish and many sea animals alongside many audio of sea animals, they are weakly paired, but not exactly paired, I'm still gonna bring them together by sampling these positive pairs first within a cluster, and then uh, across clusters, and then within these clusters. So we show that this approach allows you to transfer pretty well. Um, if I want to do audio classification, where audio is my low resource task, I can ignore other data that I have and just do audio classification with very few samples, just five audio clips. And that gets me about 74% accuracy in this meta-learning setting. 
What I can also do is try to transfer information. So learn a common representation space between image and audio, where we have more images and fewer audio. And that helps, right? Transferring from image to audio gets you 86% accuracy, again, using just five audio samples. Likewise, I can do it from text to image. If I just do few shot image classification with five samples, I get 41% accuracy. But if I learn a common representation space with text and images and use more text in that representation space, I guess get 47% accuracy on images, again, using just five images. Since we are enforcing similarity in the representation space, we can also do alignment. Right? Can I take one modality like text and retrieve closed images? Can I take image and retrieve similar audio? And we can show that we can do few shot retrieval and very fine granularities as well. So that was generalization with parallel modalities. Um, the key idea there is that you have strongly or weakly aligned pairs. And our method for aligning is to either use strong or weak alignment using contrastive learning. But sometimes you don't really have hope of obtaining all of these pairs. If I have many modalities and many tasks, each distributed across different data sets, how can I still generalize? So one approach that we design is to study these type of problems, right? If you have certain data sets with language, video, and audio for video classification, certain other data sets with audio and video for sentiment classification, and maybe certain other data sets for video and time series for robotic, for predicting robot dynamics. So I'm gonna, these modalities are gonna be partially observable. So certain modalities are gonna appear in certain tasks and certain are gonna appear in some other tasks. So one general approach we designed for these tasks is high MMT. Can we design a single shared model across all of these modalities and all of these tasks at the same time? So high MMT's idea is actually very simple. It shows very promising results. The first idea is just to standardize all your input data into a sequence. You can look at language as a sequence of words. You can look at video as a sequence of frames, uh, time series as a sequence of time steps. I'm going to encode a modality specific embedding, which is a very simple, just one hot layer. The fact that video has one embedding across your data sets that's shown in these right triangles. Audio has this embedding across your data sets in this green square and language and time series have their own embeddings as well. So just a very simple one, one hot layer. And I'm gonna define a shared multimodal model, which again is a very standard model. It's just a multimodal transformer model that uses transformers to first encode unimodal data. It uses transformers to learn uh, multimodal representations. Again, this code available if you wanna look at the details of the architecture. And finally, we're going to have different classifiers for each task and train this whole model using multitask learning. And surprisingly, using the same model architecture and more importantly, the same parameters, right? You have one model with the exact same parameters that can work well for many modalities and tasks. Um, this actually works really well. So we're gonna compare with first a baseline that uses different models with different tasks. This is perhaps the most traditional method. You have a new model and a new data set just use the different data set for that model. And over here, we're plotting all model combinations across efficiency, number of parameters, and performance, right? So if each data set has perhaps 10 state-of-the-art models, this actually plots 10,000 combinations of these models. And in red, we have the Pareto frontier. So combinations of models that gets you the best efficiency and best performance. You can then have separate high MMT, separate these multimodal transformers. These are still good. You have the same model, you're standardizing the architecture, you just use different parameters. And that immediately gets you similar performance, but with more efficiency. And finally, we can design a single high MMT multitask model, the same model with the same parameters across all of your data sets. And that maintains performance, still at very competitive levels, uh, but with much more efficiency benefits, basically dividing the number of parameters by the number of data sets that you have. So multitasking is actually really impressive. You can maintain performance across multiple tasks while maintaining efficiency due to parameter sharing. And one other very interesting observation we had is that you can also do transfer with this model. I can train this multitask model, a single model on perhaps data sets, and I can transfer it to a fourth data set. And this fourth data set might even have different sets of modalities, like time series and tables in the healthcare data set. And what we find that, for example, this target task is Mimic. If I train on zero source task, if I train on Mimic, I get 68% performance. 
if I train on one source task, I get 68.3. I get trained on two tasks before I get 68.5. And I slowly see better performance as I train on more tasks in this multitask manner. And likewise, when we look at this, your funny data set, which tries to predict humor from human behaviors, the more data sets that I've trained in a multitask manner and transfer over, the better we get. So therefore, these are some very promising results on generalization. We looked at generalization in the case of parallel data, in which case we explicitly modeled generalization through strong or weak alignment. We also looked at generalization with non-parallel data, where because you don't have paired data across all your tasks, we can't explicitly model generalization, but rather we did it implicitly by parameter sharing and multitask learning. The first case, we found generalization to be super useful for low resource data, transferring from high to low resource. And the second case, we found it super useful to generalize to many modalities and tasks. So our experiments involve more than 10 modalities and 10 tasks across six data sets. But how do these models really work? So in the last part of the talk, I'm just gonna go very quickly through some recent efforts in quantifying these multimodal models. Can I take these models, which are nowadays typically black box models, and better understand how they work? So using this running example, I'm gonna look at some of these question answering tasks. If I have a bunch of images, with a couple of shapes and colors, can I ask, is there a red shape above a circle? And I know that these models are really good. They say yes. But how can I take a magnifying gloss and understand how these models actually came up with this answer? So the contribution of this work, uh, Multivis, actually aims to take the multimodal interpretation problem and first decouple the important stages at which we should understand these multimodal models. The first important stage is unimodal importance. Does my model correctly identify important parts in each modality? For example, does it realize that red shape above a circle are important? And the fact that certain image parts are more important than others in this task. The second big one is interconnections. Does my model capture the relationships between the image and the text? When it looks at red, does it actually capture the red objects? When we look at circle, does it actually capture the circles in the image? The third one is multimodal representations. Does it learn these composite representations that each capture different features? For example, one feature that learns circles and one feature that learns red objects. It must be able to do that in order to generalize new combinations of colors and shapes. And finally, prediction. Can it take in all this evidence from representations and make a prediction on the correct answer? So I'm not gonna go into all the proposed methods for each of these stages, but just two of them. Uh, firstly, for interactions. So one insight that we had was to go back, to go back to statistics and look at definitions of interactions and statistics, right? The fact that a function f exhibits interactions between two features, if it cannot be decomposed into the sum of unimodal subfunctions, g1 and g2, on each of these features, right? If such an f exists, then you're just taking both modalities, encoding them, and adding them up. So there's no interactions there. But if a model actually captures interactions, then it should not be able to be expressed in this additive manner. So that gives us a very simple insight that a function f will exhibit interactions between these two features if the second derivative of this function with respect to both modalities is non-zero. So that gives us a very simple insight. It's a natural second order extension of many of the first order gradient-based approaches people have used in single modality learning. So what do these second order methods look like? If I have a data set, so there's this image data set and some set of questions, I can first take a gradient of the output with respect to some words that I care about. For example, tiny yellow shiny object. That's the first level gradient. And given that vector, I can then take a second level gradient with all the pixels in the image. So ideally that should tell me all the references of the uh, tiny yellow shiny object within the image. And indeed we see that it holds true, right? For these very high performing models, it, the second order gradient is non-zero exactly for the pixels that show this tiny yellow shiny object. You can do that for VQA. You can take the predicted answer, take a first order gradient with respect to a word that you care about, like birds, and take a second order gradient with all the bounding boxes in the image. And you exactly highlight the bounding boxes that show birds. You can take Flickr 30K as a retrieval data set, take the predicted answer for retrieval, take a first order gradient with respect to three small dogs, and then a second order gradient with respect to all the bounding boxes in the image. And that exactly gives you 
highlights of the most important uh, boundary boxes corresponding to the three small dogs. So again, these are correspondences, the fact that different modality elements have the same meaning. Another very interesting example we found is that for some of these emotional recognition data sets, you can again do this second order gradient method. Take a gradient of the output, the emotion that your model predicted, the first order gradient with respect to certain words, like for example, sigh and sand. Then take a second order gradient with respect to the, um, to the facial features detected by the model. And you see that it does highlight the man's sad lip, raised lip, when they are saying the words sigh and sad. So these are more relationships, the fact that they're semantically connected with underlying negative emotion. We also have some very interesting insights from multimodal representations, right? Can I take these final la layer features and do local analysis? What parts of the input data are most activated for these individual features? And I can also do global analysis. What parts of other data points also activate the same feature? So if you look at both local and global analysis, it should not be hard to see that this feature represents color, right? The fact that locally, it does pick out data points that refer to color and also highlights color in the image. And similar data points activate the feature all share the same color concept. So you can then infer that this feature represents color. But all these are great. There's still two big challenges. How can we evaluate the success of these methods? And the main difficulty is that many of these models are black box. You don't have any ground truth annotations for unimodal importance. You don't have ground truth annotations for the interactions within your data sets. So two things that we did was to first take these models that are black box in nature, look at these visualizations and give it to a human. We call this model simulation, right? If you give it to a human and the human is able to recreate model predictions just by looking at these evidences that agrees with the model, then you're visualizations would have been correct, right? If your human just looked at the black box model, they would not have been able to predict what the model did because it's a black box, it's full of matrices and nonlinear activations. And we find that indeed our multi-stage approach does improve model simulation. So the more stages that we give to the humans as evidence, the more likely they are able to predict and reconstruct the model predictions. And more importantly, they're able to reconstruct the model predictions when the model actually is incorrect. So that leads us to the second point. Can the humans actually find bugs in these models, right? The holy grail of perhaps interpreting these models is to take a black box model, visualize its evidences, how the model works, give it to a human who can then find bugs in this model and try to improve the model subsequently. So going along this running example, we found that this feature represented color. They activated locally and similar data points that all referenced color. But however, we found that the models were getting these data points wrong a higher proportion of the times. So then we found that these models do pick up the cross-modal interactions. For example, it does highlight the second man to the left. It does highlight the sign. It does highlight the building. And it does highlight the wall. So it's learning the correct relationships between image and text. But still, at the last level, it's just failing to identify color. So what should I do? Well, I can give the model more data points just involving color. And you can compare it to just giving random data points. That doesn't help the model too much. You can give the model uncertain data points. It also doesn't help too much. But if you give the data points in a targeted way, based on the errors that we find, it does improve the most. And as a side note, we actually use this approach to discover a bug in one of these very common deep learning code bases on transformers. And exactly it was the fact that um, the color pre-processing thing, the color pre-processing step in some of these image models was difficult or was incorrect. So to summarize, we look at a couple of things in this talk. And the first key takeaway is that multimodal is a science of heterogeneous and interconnected data. The fact that when you're given new multimodal data sets, you should first reason about how my modalities are different. Now can I capture these differences and how my modalities are related to each other? And how can I capture these relationships when I build multimodal models? And a lot of these two key properties are exemplified in the subsequent challenges. How can I learn representations that capture heterogeneity and interconnections? How can I then do alignment of my data that best captures the connections across my modalities? How can I do reasoning in a principled and interpretable manner that combines information one after the next? How can I do generation of new modalities? And how can I also transfer information from one modality that may be high resource to another modality that's of low resource? And finally, the key challenge of quantification that we looked at recently 
by opening up these black box models to understand how these models capture heterogeneity and these connections. And finally, looked at some specific examples of my recent work towards generalization beyond language and vision into many modalities and tasks and quantification, taking these models, opening them up and seeing how they work and better debugging these models. And of course, this work wouldn't have been possible without many collaborators, including Liang Chung, who's in the audience today. And thank you for your attention, everyone. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Paul, for the very detailed presentation of multimodal machine learning. Before we um, ask questions, let's all give Paul a round of virtual applause. OK, so is there any question from the audience? Um, I actually have a very like broad overall question uh, for Paul. So in your multimodal MRO research, um, have you found out um, adding more modalities is always better or is it like you have to um, be smart about which modalities to use? Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, this is very aligned with one of these core challenges on quantification. Again, um, there's been some work from myself and also some work from other groups that we're going to release in the survey paper studying quantification. But a key insight is that you do have to be careful with this, right? What are the new information provided by modalities? That would be great to think about. And also the moment that you add, typically you also run into certain learning and optimization challenges. So sometimes you do have to kind of better balance the learning and optimization in, in your model. I think one easy key takeaway is that when you're approaching a new problem, just first try out the best unimodal models on each modality, right? That gives you a simple sense of the information contained in each one, how much each individual modality is sufficient. And then you can start um, training these multimodal models to see how much they capture. Mm -hmm, got it. So um, do you, is there any actually like a research or a line of research that, um, quantifies or like helps folks to select um, modalities um, instead of like, I mean, in addition to domain knowledge. Um, I guess domain knowledge is still important to help. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are, I think, so you just start training model models in unimodal models and then start training multimodal models to look at a performance gap. That's right. a perhaps um, a naive approach. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have to compute, you can definitely do that. And there's also some other insights. And those insights are that if you, you can first train a multimodal model, so don't train a unimodal model, train a multimodal model. And then there's this recent approach called EMAP, which basically takes your multimodal model and automatically decomposes it into the best possible sum of unimodal models. And then you can start looking at what's a performance drop. If mm -hmm. a multimodal model is almost equivalent to a sum of unimodal models, which they automatically discover, that means you're still, multimodal is still helpful, but just at a final additive level. If you're losing a lot of performance when you decompose your additive models, then there's some deeper interactions going on within your data. But yeah, these all fall broadly into quantification. And again, I think this is really long survey paper with almost 800 references that we're gonna be releasing super soon. Um, so that will go into a lot of the exact methods in those directions. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Looking forward to the survey paper. Thanks. Um, I have a quick question if you have a minute or two. For the high MMT, you said you had a single model architecture on all the multimodal inputs. Could you give us more details about the training strategy or scheduling? Uh, was it like randomly across all modes or like you had one modality and then another you training on another modality in a round robin fashion? How, how did you go about doing that? Yeah, so um, this high MMT approach. So I think the best, the key answer I can give you is that the code is all publicly available on my website. Sure, sure. Training strategy, everything is publicly available. But to kind of sum up, it is pretty standard multitask learning. Multitask learning where you kind of iterate through multiple data sets that you have. And we had about six data sets. Each data set has certain modalities and tasks. And you kind of do non-parallel multitask learning. So basically train the parameters the model is involved in when you encounter those modalities and those tasks. Uh, we also did some very simple weight balancing, uh, very standard multitask learning. The fact that you perhaps should weight your loss proportional to the number of training samples. 
Uh, you don't want kind of like huge data sets to dominate smaller data sets. Sure. But we found these, it was not super sensitive to some of these uh, multi-class training strategies and it worked generally pretty well. Although one caveat I want to give is that we weren't really aiming for state-of-the-art performance. Uh, and I think we found DeepMind who kind of did something similar with the Gado paper, which you might've seen. They tried to train a single model over many reinforcement learning environments. They were also multimodal in nature. They also found that it maintains performance. Right? It gets you can kind of train a model that is almost equivalent to having individual models, but See. it was difficult to push it further to having uh, individual models. Although, kind of, yeah. you know, maybe if you kind of train it in some special way or train it longer, you might get better than individual model performance. Right. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, I guess like this. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but like in some of the cases, it matters of like whether you upsample the the modalities that are not really well represented or the modes that are not well represented in our training. And that then the multimodality training tends to be very sensitive to some of these things, right? Yes, we kind of did that in a very simple approach, just approximating it by the number of samples. So smaller data sets, although we didn't kind of count modalities exactly, but just data points. And I think that relates to CE's question, right? You know, certain people have also found that in certain cases, adding more modalities makes it more challenging to optimize. And there has been recent work in kind of trying to balance the um, the learning. Uh, right. Again, I think that's going to come up. Like there, are, I know a couple of references in my mind. It's going to be in a survey paper. It's going to be a section on just like optimization challenges. Awesome. Which, as you're right, you know, you do have to balance the training really well. Oh, cool. Yeah, look forward to that for sure. Thanks. Is there any other questions? If not, let's thank Paul again for the great presentation. Um, we will upload the recording of this talk to our YouTube channel later today. If you have further questions, feel free to reach out to us or um, reach out to Paul directly. Thank you everyone for joining us today and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. See ya.